Many times, I feel like my algorithms are trying to beat me at the be the smartest game. And so we are going to play a little. And we are going to see if my algorithms are better than me or not. And so we are doing a little match between me, or it may be you, or you colleagues, or AI experts, versus real algorithms, uh, pun intended. So, are you ready? Round one, the accuracy paradox. Fight. Uh, when we have customers with AI need, we often start with a five-day discovery workshop. And during five days, we are trying a lot of things to better understand the customer needs, to better understand the problem, the business, uh, what will work and what will not work. And so in this case, we have a customer with a fault detection problem on a production line. Uh, they produce round objects that are made of layers glued together. I will not show you the real images because we are under an ADA with this customer. Moreover, my manager is somewhere here. And uh, when you glue together two layers, you can have many defects. You can have bubble, you can have border defect, like a scratch, or micro defects that are very small compared to the size of the object. The images are infrared, that is to say in gray levels, and of high quality. And so we tried a convolutional neural network on that. And this are the first results. Take that algorithm. 99% of accuracy in two epochs. Very well. Well, in fact, if you work in AI for a while, you know that when it seems to work too much, too good, <laughs> too quick, it's that, in fact, it's not working at all. And this is exactly what we had, as if you look at the confusion matrix. And this is what we had. So, yeah, as you can see, the better solution for our algorithm was to predict that everything was OK, because we had 99% of OK images and only 1% of defects. And this is exactly what is called the accuracy paradox. The accuracy paradox is when you have a major class with a lot of data and some minor classes with very few data. And if you have such data set, the problem is that the algorithm will say that everything belongs to the major class because it is the easiest way to have a big accuracy. And this is the accuracy paradox, high accuracy, very poor results. So what to do? You can do six things when you have such a problem. The first thing is to gather more data. Of course, is if your data are with the same distribution, it will not help at all. So you have to gather more data from the minor classes. The second one is to do a resample of the data. If you have a lot of data in the major class, you will only have to drop some data to have a better balanced distribution. The first solution is to change the metric. The accuracy is not a good metric when, when you have imbalanced classes. The fourth one is to penalize the model, that is to say to add a penalty when uh, data from the minor classes are not well classified. The fifth one is to change the algorithm, and it's not always possible. Sometimes you have to take that algorithm and you cannot change, but it could help. And the last one is to do data augmentation, that is to say, to create new data for the minor classes. And this is what we tried. So for each image with a defect, we have made five images with flip-flop rotate mirror operations. Uh, they are round objects, so they are no importance to flip the images. And so we had only 95% uh, of good images and 5% of defects. And we had an accuracy of 99%. Take that algorithm. So we are not stuck in the accuracy paradox anymore. And we looked at the confusion matrix. And well, if you look at the digits, you will see that we had 15 images at the beginning with defects. And we have made 75 images with data augmentation. 
And yes, this is exactly what we have here. In fact, the algorithm was classifying between the original images and the data augmented images, so it's not working. Okay, I think algorithm, you have won the first round. So, round two, I've lost one round, I didn't lose the match for no. The second round is the evaluation function definition. Fight. When you have to choose the metric you will use, or fitness function, or function, evaluation function, you have a lot of choice. And for classification problem, for example, you have the accuracy. We have seen it is not a good metric with imbalanced classes, but you also have precision, recall, sensitivity, specificity, detection rate, the F1 score, and so on. And you have data documentation on them, so it's not very hard to find. Maybe it's hard to choose the right one, but you can find them. If you are in a regression problem, no suicide, there are metrics. The most important is the root mean squared error, but it's not the only one, and you can find documentation on that. But if you are in a behavioral task, maybe you are trying to teach something to a robot, how can you decide the evaluation function? The only thing you will find is schemas like that, with a green curve that is the good one and red that are not right, because the evaluation function has to be continuous, differentiable, progressive, easy to implement, easy to, uh, to compute, and clearly defined. But in practice, how can you do? No one will say you, how can you do that? And so, Oh, during my PhD courses, we wanted to teach uh, spiders how to work with uh, legs, as we can't control the real spiders. We worked with virtual spiders, and it's less terrifying. And the first evaluation function we chose was the distance made in 10 seconds by the spider. And this is what we had. Oh, it's not the real simulation. But the spiders were rolling because it is very easy to roll when you are spiders. But uh, once on their back, they couldn't get on their feet again. So they were just staying on the back and moving the legs like that until the end of the simulation. It was not what we wanted. We wanted the spider to walk. In fact, they are spiders that are rolling. This is a desert spider that is rolling. So you can find them, but it's not the kind of spiders that we wanted. So, OK, algorithm. The second try, we add a criterion. It is the distance made in 10 seconds without rolling. And in fact, they used a bug. Well, not this kind of bug. They used a bug in OpenJL library. And we have done a division by, by the cosine of 90 degrees. and. Uh, the cosine of 90 degrees is zero, and when you do a division by zero, you have an infinite force. And so the spiders were just flying around, around <laughs> until the end of the world, the uh, end of the simulated world. And we were in C++, so the end of the world is two billion and some uh, other numbers. Uh. So it's not what we wanted, never. I googled the flying spiders, and yes, I found that. So don't panic, don't make nightmares. Uh, when I found that, I said, no, it's not possible. Fl flying spiders can't exist. And in fact, it is a nox. So there are no flying spiders around. <laughs> we made then a third try, and we fixed the bug. So it was not possible anymore to divide by zero. And uh, this is what we obtained. In fact, the spider was using its eight legs in a very specific manner. Three legs were used to stay in the right orientations without rolling. It is stable with three. Two of those legs were used to crawl and to move. Two legs to move. One leg was epileptic. We don't know why. And the two hours were over its head to add stability. Well, 
I think it is not really what we wanted, and we didn't manage to have a spider walking with eight legs. So, okay, algorithm, I think you have won this round too. So, what can you do? The rule of thumb when you are doing behavioral tasks is to speak to a child. Uh, for example, some months ago, I asked my daughter in a Nike restaurant to eat with the fork because she was eating uh, with a hand. And this is what she has done. First, she has picked the food with her hand. Second, she has picked the food on the fork. And then, she ate with the fork. And she was very proud of her, because she was eating with an adult fork, and it was not at all what I wanted. So the solution is to have no implicit, only explicit things uh, in your phrase. And the right phrase is, Take the food with the fork and put it on your, in your mouth without touching it. And it will be exactly the same in behavioral task. Remember it, ask, you, uh, ask a child to do it, and no implicit, and it will work. Maybe not with a spider, but uh, it will work for you, I hope. So I've lost the first round, I've lost the second round, but there is a final round. So the overfitting spotting, this one may be easy. So go fight. And in fact, when you speak about overfitting, you always see curves like that. Uh, you have the training error that is decreasing with the time. The validation is decreasing and then is increasing again. And you may know that the optimum is at the minimum of the validation error. Before the optimum, you have not learned enough. And after the optimum, you have learned too much. And in fact, you are just learning the data set examples. And you are not learning the problem. So OK, when you have curves, when you have data set, when you have validation error, it's, it's easy. But in a behavioral task, what can you do? In a behavioral task, you don't have data set. You don't have validation error. And so uh, we have done simulation with a robot, and we were trying to teach the robot to avoid the walls. The first try we have made for the evaluation function was the time until a collision with a wall with 10 seconds of simulation. And of course, we had that. It's an image, but it could be the video too, because the simplest way to not touch the wall is to not move. So, second try, time moving until a collision with a wall, and this time we had that. I don't touch the walls anymore. Uh, it's not really what we wanted, so we had the third try, time moving forward until a collision with a wall, and we had that. Yes, I won. The robots were avoiding the walls. So, we thought that it was okay. And we tried to put it in the real robots that we had. And in fact, it was not working at all. The robots sometimes were turning around with no walls, and sometimes we were not turning with a wall, so there were collision. And in fact, they had just learned the specific cage in which they were in the simulation, and they were not using the sensors at all. So we haven't seen the overfitting because we hadn't a data set and we had no curve. So I think this time again, I've lost. What can you do when you are in a behavioral task? The solution that I have is to add randomness. Add randomness in your simulation, in the beginning position of the robot, in the size of the cage. Maybe you can add obstacles at random, of course, in the cage. And then you will have something interesting. And the second one is to, is to test uh, as quickly as possible uh, with real robots. Because even if you think you are doing exactly the same thing, you will not do exactly the same thing. And you will add randomness in the reality. So randomness in the simulation and test as soon as possible. So I'm at the end uh, of my presentation. I think I've lost the first. Uh, round the accuracy paradox. I've lost the second one on the evaluation function definition, and I think I've lost the third one on the overfitting spotting. So, yeah, I think Liu wins. Thank you, and next time I will be the smartest. <laughs>